الحمد لله الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام الحمد لله الذي أحيانا بعدما أماتنا وإليه النشور الحمد لله على نعمة القرآن وعلى نعمة رسالة النبي العدنان اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحابته ومن اتبع سنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We have been talking about the change we need. Last time we spoke about the need for raising a different generation. A generation that knows its deen, that knows its duties, that knows what it needs to do. And the most important issue we need to cover today is what is it exactly that is expected of us both as parents and as a community. Our next generation is waiting for us to do things differently. Muslims have always had mosques in the past. Muslims have always had the Quran in the past. Muslims have always had children in the past. But we squandered all of the above, and that's how we brought the generation that we adults belong to, the generation of silence when we needed to speak, the generation that sat on its hands waiting for things to happen, and when th things happen the way we do not want, all what we did is to scream. That if we do. So we lost a large swath of the Muslim land, a large degree of our dignity, and a whole lot of our power as Muslims. The power of faith, the power of unity, and the power of cooperation, and the power of working together. So we need to raise a generation that is different, and the tools are the same. You have the masjid, you have the Quran, you still have the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, if you want to have it. And you still have your children. So the task is either we recopy our generation in their generation, or to look for different ways to use the tools we have to produce a different generation. First, let us talk about what is different in the following generation that we need to be better than our generation. First of all, Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu arda, he used to say, pay attention to the needs of your children because they are raised for a time that is different than yours. So the difference of time requires different ways of dealing with the children. Here, we don't only have the difference of time, but we also have the difference of place, and the difference of circumstances, and the difference between the knowledge of previous generations, and the degree of ignorance that plagues our generation. So we need to do something about this issue. To do anything, you have yourself to be aware and knowledgeable of what needs to be done. We always think about raising children as preaching to children, but that's not what we should be talking about. Raising a child is much more than preaching to a child. Even that preaching that we do to our children is very limited to times only when and after they do something ominously wrong. Why? Because we don't have time for our children, period. Our generation has squandered the largest resources of our community worldwide, not only here, but everywhere. To care for the next generation, our generation needs to feel somewhat satisfied because we are a selfish type creature. Al-insan bakhil. So, Unless we are satisfied, we will not be able to give our children anything. If you don't get respect, 
it's difficult to give respect. But it is not impossible. If you don't have resources, it is difficult to give resources. But again, it is not impossible. Especially between parents and children, the parent generosity has made the Quran admonish children to be kind to their parents, but there is no similar, similar, I'm not saying there is none, but there is not similar in instructions for parents to be kind to their children. But the Arabs understood that it goes without saying that if you want something, you have to plant it, and you have to take care of it to grow it. Then you can harvest. We want to harvest from our children what we have not planted. We want them to be kind and respectful. When we raise them through methods that do not show enough kindness and enough love and enough care. Actually, we left them with the excuse that we don't have time. And I can't imagine one of us would be open and dare himself to tell his children in a meeting, I don't have time for you. So we don't, but we actually don't give them time. So the number one thing to give your children, if you want to do anything for them or with them, is time. Some will say, I work 10, 12 hours a day. I actually don't have time. No, make them 13. If you work 12, make them 13 hours. If you work 10, make them 11. And everybody can imagine what his or her schedule is like. But not giving our children nothing, and we want them to become angels and prophets, is not going to happen. It is not going to happen. We want our children to grow up as faithful. And that's a very thoughtful principle to have. But how they become faithful believing in Allah, trusting Allah, when they do not see this from us. When they do not see us doing what a faithful person normally should do, then how do they inherit what is not there in the treasure of their own parents? So the first thing is to designate time to sit down with your children and talk to them and explore their interests, their concerns, their fears, their hopes, their aspirations, their daily life, what is challenging them and what they need to do so that you can fit yourself into their agenda as to how and what you can help them with. But you leave them blank under the excuse of I don't have time is not a solution, it is a problem. So imagine a child who has two parents, but he has none. The Arab poet says, لَيْسَ الْيَتِيمُ مَنْ انْتَهَى أَبَوَاهُ مِنْ هَمِّ الْحَيَاةِ وَخَلَّفَاهُ ذَلِيلًا إِنَّ الْيَتِيمَ مَنْ الْتَقَى أُمَّا تَخَلَّتْ أَوْ أَبًا مَشْغُولًا an orphan is not someone whose parents have died and left him in difficulties and misery. An orphan indeed is one who grew up with a mother that has neglected her duty or a father who abandoned them saying, I am too busy. This is the orphan. This is how the Arabs understood that you become an orphan, not necessarily when your parent dies, but when your parent is alive, but for you, he's dead, he's out of the picture. He doesn't ask, he doesn't check, he doesn't sit, he doesn't talk, because in his head, he filled it with other, more important things than you. You think it's difficult on your ears to hear it, but this is the reality. When you leave your children's interest to do something different, that means that 
different thing is more important than your children and their future. So I'm, started, I'm starting by focusing on us parents who want to raise a great Muslim leader generation or leading generation, we must focus on our duty as parents first. Then when it comes to our children, yes, we need to raise a faithful generation. A faithful generation is defined in the Quran as a generation that complies with all the description of the believers in the Quran. What is faith? What is goodness? What is righteousness? The Quran says, ليس البر أن تولوا وجوهكم قبل المشرق والمغرب. Righteousness is not just about turning east or west. ولكن البر من آمن بالله. The first thing about righteousness is to believe in Allah. What do we want to believe in Allah? That He created us? Well, the pagan Arabs understood that much. وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَهُمْ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ Even Iblis acknowledges that Allah created him. So for our kids to only be taught that Allah created us is a given. It, it shouldn't be a subject. But because they are young, they need to be taught even that. But a normal human being should never ignore that fact. Nor should anybody ignore the fact that Allah is the provider. Because definitely, even Iblis, when he wanted to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and challenge his new creation, he swore by Allah. And he asked Allah to give him the gift of life. قَالَ أَنظِرْنِي إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Give me a chance until the day they are resurrected. Allah did not give him the chance until the day of resurrection. But he gave him a chance إِلَى يَوْمِ الْوَقْتِ الْمَعْلُومِ Which is the day that he will die. Which means you are like everybody else. You will die on a day like everybody else. So he didn't give him what he asked. Why he didn't? Because if Iblis were to live until the day people are resurrected, it means that Iblis will outlive everybody else. Allah didn't want to give him that. He wanted his temptation to finish here with our life, not beyond. So in any way, Allah is the provider, Allah is the creator, Allah is the Rabb, He is the caretaker. He is the one who takes care of everything you cannot. Our children, unless you teach them that statement, they will not figure it on their own. We know the story of the Prophet وسلم, when Ibn Abbas was joining him on a ride on the back of a donkey or camel, and the Prophet وسلم, told him, Ya Bunayya, إِنِّي مُعَلِّمُكَ كَلِمَاتٍ فَاحْفَظْهَا Oh my son, I am teaching you certain words so that you may keep it. Keep it doesn't mean memorize it. Keep it means to keep it as a guide in your life. To take it as a guide, as a torch for your life. احفظ يا بني احفظ الله يحفظك Oh my son, keep Allah so that Allah may keep you. يا بني احفظ الله تجده تجاهك If you keep memorizing Allah, memorizing means remembering Allah, then you will find Allah always ahead of you, always in front of your eyes. Do you remember the situation with Prophet Yusuf السلام, when the lady of the palace tempted him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَوْلَا أَرَّأَ بُرْهَانَ رَبِّهِ Were it not for him seeing evidence of Allah 
سبحانه وتعالى لولا الرأى برهان ربه what would have happened لهم بها وهم بها لولا الرأى برهان ربه means he did not make him because he saw evidence from Allah why because from the outset he told her معاذ الله the minute she invited him he sought refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very important that we teach our children that there is an appropriate critical moment to protect you from evil that when you are invited you immediately run to Allah ففروا إلى الله flee towards Allah very important our children do not know that until we explain to them what the book tells them they do not understand on their own they do not even have the knowledge even if they memorize Surah Yusuf they can memorize it but it doesn't mean that they know it it doesn't mean they pick the lessons it doesn't mean they turn a lesson into practice they need the guidance that Allah has given us in the form of understanding of the Quran so a great generation is different from a generation that memorizes the Quran more than it understands the Quran even though memorizing the Quran is central for understanding the Quran but at the same time you cannot just limit your relationship with the Quran to making the Quran a sounded voice that you read it in your own voice you rehearse it in your own voice that doesn't add much what adds is when you act the Quran in your life and the way to turn the Quran into practice is to understand it so Aisha radiallahu anha when she was asked about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how he was, how his manners were she said كَانَ خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآنِ if you want to know the manners of the Prophet look into the Quran that was him it was him who takes care of the orphan who carries a helpless person who runs after somebody who is needy he seeks those out he doesn't wait for them to come to his home so she says كان خلقه القرآن the manners of the prophet were nothing but the Quran itself we need this kind of generation and that also requires that we also change somewhat to make the Quran our manners so that the children not only hear it as a lesson but see it as practice in you the parent as a role model most of us men do not spend time with our children assuming that it is for the mother to raise a child that is true but you are also called a parent right and you're proud to call your children my children so on what basis are they yours if you are not theirs they are your children but you are not their parent their parent becomes the mother who cares that's the real parent the other parent who doesn't care is a dead parent because he has effectively divorced his children out of his life but the parent who cares is the parent that gets the care when he grows old and needs the children who became men and women to help so let us not wait for that moment the assumption that the wife is the one that cares the mother is the one that's supposed to do this it doesn't come out of a vacuum it is because the mother is the one that can care for children when they are young that's true but after that what is your role even during that time why don't you carry the child sometime and show the child your love your affection your care why don't you help your wife take care of the child the same way she does oh because I am the father is this an excuse it is because you are the father that you have to care it is not because you are not so 
I believe that the perception we are living with is stretched beyond reason. So after early childhood, after two, three years and four, and the child is clean and he's ready to go to school and everything else, what is your role? You say, I will pay the tuition, if there is tuition, right? Or I will drop him to the bus, right? That's not enough. That is like saying, I'm going to give you food, but I'm not going to give you medicine if you need it. Children need to talk to parents, plural, parents, the two, not just one. Besides, both of you are equally and jointly responsible for the behavior, the manner, the faith, and the choices of your children. So if you divorce yourself from the process of raising a child, then it is only half resources, which is the resources of the mother. So if she doesn't know, except what she knows, you're depriving your children from your guidance. Then they grow and they enter into the teenage and you start seeing the challenges coming at you from your own children. And then you tell your wife, you spoiled him. Come on, you should have helped first. You spoiled him. And I told you to do that. I told you not to... Why don't you do what you want to do? Why don't you raise the child and take responsibility? Oh, because the child is for the mother to care for. This theory destroyed several generations. If you read the writings of great scholars of their time and beyond, like Al-Ghazali, Ibn Al-Qayyim, Ibn Rushd, all of these people, they said that parenting it takes full two time full time two parents full time to raise a single child hillary clinton discovered it takes more she wrote a book titled it takes a village to raise a child and indeed it does you need on, not only the home to raise a child but you need the school you need the masjid you need other social institutions to help support the home endeavor of raising a righteous child. So when do we raise a child unless we dedicate time for that child? Even if it is one child. We always say, I raised three kids, I raised four kids. When did you raise them? Does it mean that you fed them? Does it mean that you brought money for them to be fed? Is this the role that you think you should be doing? I am talking to myself and to you because it is whoever is here is the one I need to talk to, not the ones who didn't come yet. Those who do not come, they must have gone somewhere else. But we need to know as a community that a generation starts with a child. A child starts with a home. And the home starts with two people agreeing to establish a family and agreeing on one policy to raise a child. Even those parents who are engaged, fully engaged in raising a child, they do not agree on two things. Two things, they don't agree. Why? Because everybody wants to do things their way. And that's why many people say, I left them for the mother, because whenever we do something together, it fails. I believe we shouldn't fail. I believe we should do what Allah says we need to do. وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ Join hands and cooperate in matters of goodness and righteousness, and do not cooperate on matters of sinfulness and wickedness. This is what the Quran is saying. So if two adults who chose each other for partners, for life, do not want to agree, that means there must be a resolution for this kind of gridlock. It doesn't mean they should divorce or they should abandon the child one side or the other. But rather, the Quran teaches us that the ultimate responsibility sp st stands with the father the husband 
And that also means that the ultimate responsibility for taking the final decision also stays with the father. So our sisters who are listening to me, they need to know when you disagree with your husband over any matter, not only children rearing, but on any matter, express your opinion. And your husband must consider and factor your opinion in his decision and consider your expectations as part of his decision as a matter of deen. But it doesn't mean that he must listen to your opinion and do it. So when he does not follow your opinion, it doesn't mean that he is offensive towards you. It does mean he doesn't see your views. So it now depends on how much you, the wife, are able to convince your husband of what you expect and what you want and why. And if you could not convince him, you leave him with one thing and one thing only. That is his own opinion. And no problem should stand in the way of life for life. Every problem has to have a solution. So the solution in case of dispute over any issue in the family is that the husband must consult and the wife must advise. But the husband must also factor her advice in his decision, but she cannot force him to follow her opinion. Why? Because he doesn't see it, he doesn't agree with it. Ibn al-Qayyim is the one that made that formula. He said, the advice is compulsory on the advising body. If you're advising me, your advice is compulsory on you. But it is not compulsory on me to follow it. Not because I am imam, no, because I am advised. He says, because if we make it compulsory on the advised, then we turn it from an advice into a command. تتحول النصيحة من نصيحة إلى أمر So if it is نصيحة say it and leave it If it is a command say I want to command you to do this But don't use a نصيحة as a pretext for a command because it doesn't work this way So the wife which has lots of leverage to make her husband want to do what she wants must use her leverage. Most of our sisters do not know the leverage and the power they have. But I'm not going to say it here because the husbands are sitting. So I will say it in my session with the sisters. They have lots of leverage and they know how to make their husband want, not only do, but want to do whatever pleases her. So use your leverage. And convince him. And if you fail, it means the matter is beyond the conviction. He is convinced of something else. Go back. Our children need a household in which the father and the mother have one and the same policy towards each child. How come you say each child when you say it's a policy? Well, a policy is a way to deal with something. It can be different from one child to another because not all children are one the same personality. So you have to have a joint view of each child of yours so that you don't get into a lot of differences. The reason we differ on policy and approach is the fact that we see our children in different lights. So you see that our old daughter is good. I see that she is sneaky. Right? then how could we agree? We have to discuss your foundation for your conclusion and my foundation for my conclusion and evidence will help us see closer to each other or reconcile our views to something in the middle. So we need to talk about our children and we need to evaluate on what basis do I see that child as the greatest child of all times and you see him or her as the most devilish child of his time. So, 
one of the issues that we fail to do is to talk about our children. So we don't only have, we don't only say that we don't have time for our children, but we don't take time to discuss with our spouses what our children are like or not like and what they need. And this is a primary step. Inshallah, we'll continue this issue as long as Allah gives us life and time, inshallah, and ability. But we need to focus on this issue. Raising a great Muslim leadership generation is what our ummah needs. To break the cycle of indignity, humiliation, excuses, ignorance, exploitation, tyranny, all of those diseases are going to be taken care of once we focus on raising a leadership generation that knows Allah, knows its duties, knows its messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and knows what their future should look like. May Allah show us the way. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد I want to leave you with a task I want to leave you with a task I want you to go read the story of Luqman advising his son and I want you to read the discussion between Ibrahim and his father. The least will show you is that with or without being on the same religion, on the same page, you will see that parents continue to talk to their children and children continue to talk to their parents. That's a task. I hope that you take it to heart and benefit from these two stories and the lessons they offer. The first one is in the uh, Surah uh, Maryam and no, Surah Luqman is the story of Luqman, of course, but the story of Ibrahim, you find it close to the end of Surah Al-An'am and also in Surah Maryam, you see Ibrahim talking to his son and his son talking to him and exchanging discussion over faith, very critical and sensitive issue but the discussion goes in a very, very respectful way, at least from the side of Ibrahim, until his father told him, leave me alone. Then Ibrahim answers the way that he will see. So for us to say that we don't have time is itself a problem. For us not to spend time with our wives to discuss those issues, and to focus on the importance of raising a different generation is a very important solution to this problem. We cannot abandon our children with any excuse, no matter how valid it may be. You should never abandon this. Even if you cannot see your children one hour a day, at least make it some time every week where the family sits down around the Qur'an, around some hadith, around some stories of the Prophet or the companions of the Prophet, so that children would see themselves at least in one or more of those great companions and those great generations. Inshallah, if Allah gives us life next time, we'll talk about some of those great leaders who became the founders of the kingdom of Islam, the kingdom of righteousness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us raise a great generation. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt, wa aafina fi man aafayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa qina wa asrif anna sharra ma qadayt. Allahumma aqsim lana min khashiyatika ma tahulu bi baynana wa bayna maasiyatik, wa min ta'atika ma tubalighuna bihi jannatak, wa min al yaqeen ma tuhawun bihi alayna masaib al-dunya, wa matti'na Allahumma bi asma'ina wa absarina, وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا 
وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا مبتلا إلا عافيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا سائلا إلا أعطيته ولا ميتا إلا رحمته ولا مجاهدا إلا نصرته اللهم انصر عبادك المجاهدين في كل مكان اللهم انصر عبادك المجاهدين في كل مكان اللهم انصر عبادك المجاهدين في كل مكان اللهم وحد صفهم وسدد رميتهم واجمع كلمتهم وانصرهم على عدوك وعدوهم اللهم أمين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة